Prophets Purge and Nicole. I want to welcome you back to the virtual Wild Woman Cry Conference series. I'm back at it again, and I hope that you enjoy session four, behavioral health, depression, overcoming worries. Well, well listen, listen, get ready, get ready for today's to session. session. Get, get ready to turn, to turn your life, life around. Get ready, get ready to do it, do it again. again. You know, the HIV epidemic really remains a significant public health issue and has increasingly concentrated among racial, ethnic, and sexual, and gender and minority communities. More than 700,000 American lives have been lost to HIV since 1981. More than 1.1 million Americans are currently living with HIV, and many, many more to come are at risk of HIV infection. While new HIV diagnoses have declined greatly from the peak, progress on further reducing them has stalled, with an estimated 38,000 Americans being newly diagnosed each year. And when I think about this, like my heart aches, like, right? Because you want to figure out what can we do? How can we get past this? Well, ladies, all of my women out there, we represent one in five new HIV diagnoses in the U.S. Women of color, transgender women continue to be affected by HIV. So how can the nation work towards ending the U.S. HIV epidemic by 2030? When we're also missing the mark and people are paying the price with their lives. Today's session, HIV and STIs, Ending the HIV Epidemic, is being moderated by Reverend Carmi Washington Flood. Our panelists were experts from areas of public health will address why we must prioritize women and girls, especially women of color, and public health, planning to develop policies and programs that address the social and structural inequalities and inequalities that pose barriers to HIV testing prevention, care, and adequate funding sources for women and girls. The Wild Women Cry Conference series is not just about surviving, but it is about thriving. It's not just about, you know, making it, but of course, about making it happen. We thrive, we dance in the face of fear with purpose and passion. Let's get past this. We need to end this intersecting injustices that drive new HIV infections and prevent people from accessing services. Listen, for those of you who want to live, with passion and purpose. It's time for you to step up to the table. The time is now. And make your presence known. Don't just be counted in the number as those who are not just content to read about, but those women who are actually ready to make history. Ladies, we gotta be history makers, all right? This is our moment. This is our movement. This is our magic. Stay tuned and be sure to hit that share button, okay? And bring another sister who needs to learn, live, and laugh. This is Why Women Cry 2021. Hello, everybody. Welcome back again. Thank you so much, Persia. Always, you do such a wonderful opening for us. Uh, we told you from the very beginning when we kicked it off back in early June that we would be coming week after week for a straight seven weeks. And here we are at session number five. Thank you again for showing up. Reverend Deborah Hickman and I said that because you couldn't come to us, we were coming to you. We were coming to your living rooms, dining rooms. Some of us, we are right even in your bedroom. We are with you wherever you are on the street or in the coffee house. We are going to make sure that the information gets to you where you are so that you can use it for however you are. Thank you again for joining us today with this brand new session, HIV and STIs Ending the Epidemic. We are bound for a great conversation because we have great guests that are joining. And we couldn't do this without some of our other partners. So right now, let's hear from Dr. Peter DiMartino, who is the Director of the Infectious Disease Prevention and Health Services Bureau over at the Maryland Department of Health. Come on, Peter. Hello, my name is Peter DiMartino, and I serve as the director of the Infectious Disease Prevention and Health Services Bureau, which sits under the Maryland Department of Health Prevention and Health Promotion Administration. It is our mission to protect, promote, and improve the health and well being of all Marylanders and their families through the provision of public health leadership and community based public health efforts. For the last 16 years, the Why Women Cry Conference has served as one of those critical public health efforts where we have been able to partner our staffing expertise, our programs, and other resources to engage the community in meaningful dialogue regarding issues impacting women's health and wellness. Beginning as a commemorative response to the issue of HIV, and highlighting National Women and Girls HIV AIDS Awareness Day, this annual conference has grown to focus to include the full impact of the social determinants of health on gender-informed care. 
as our Bureau collaborates with local health departments, faith and community-based organizations, and other public and private partners to respond to the issues related to sexual and drug user health. It is essential that experiences such as the Why Women Cry conference continue to push the envelope in providing education and equitable service access to women and girls across Maryland. I take great pleasure in recognizing the leadership of Reverend Deborah Hickman as a national voice for transforming women's health. True women's health care means ensuring that no matter what someone looks like or where they come from, access to care remains essential. Today, we are proud to be active partners in this endeavor to build a healthier Maryland. We wish you much success with this virtual conference series. Thank you so much, Peter. And always the Maryland Department of Health has been supportive of the Why Women Cry Conference and the efforts that have been pushed by Sisters Together and Reaching under the leadership of Reverend Dr. Deborah Hickman. You, you know, this year, 2021, marked the 40th anniversary of when the first five cases of what would later become known as AIDS were officially reported. Over the last four decades, there have been challenges, champions, and choices that have emerged as public health workers across all fields have sought solutions to diagnose, treat, and care for the more than 1.2 million people in the United States known to have HIV. Like the current COVID pandemic, HIV continues to have a disproportionate impact on certain populations, particularly racial and ethnic minorities. Among women, disparities also exist. Black women are disproportionately affected by HIV as compared to women of other races and ethnicities. Although annual HIV infections remain stable among Black women from 2014 to 2018, the rate of new infections among Black women is 13 times that of white women and four times that of Latinx populations. While social determinants of health, such as stigma, poverty, medical mistrust, and fear of discrimination often stand in the way of getting access to testing and treatment, there are some gender specific challenges that negatively impact outcomes for women. Today though, we are fortunate to have two incredible forces in the arena of HIV and other STIs in the persons of Dr. Victoria Cargill and certified nurse practitioner, Barbara Wilgus. Both of these clinicians have forged paths enabling providers and patients to gain better education, better resources, and better access to services and supports, especially those targeting the health needs of women. It is actually our hope today, as we lean into the expertise of our panelists, that we will engage the listening audience in a meaningful dialogue regarding issues impacting women's health and wellness related to HIV and STIs. You know, if you were too afraid to ask before, we are inviting you to let go your fears and join our panelists as they lead this conversational line dance to needed answers and solutions. For those of you who remember the historic Soul Train line dance, Everybody in the room would stand on opposite sides, rocking to the music, while the featured dancer would take center stage and come down the middle in a choreographed spotlight that would show off their best moves. So right now, let me introduce for you Dr. Victoria Cargill. Dr. Vicki Cargill is currently the Assistant Commissioner of the Baltimore City Health Department. She received her medical degree from Boston University of Medicine and has practiced for well more than 30 years and is still saving people's lives. She is what we would call a revolutionary researcher, using and interpreting data to develop policies and programs that meet the needs of individuals and not just institutions. 
Dr. Vicki, it is certainly my pleasure to step to the side and let you take center stage as the virtual dance floor is all yours. <laughs> well, thank you, Carmi. I must say I hadn't thought about uh, the Soul Train dance in a long time. So uh, this is gonna be a lot of fun. Since uh, we have time constraints and there's so much to talk about, let's go ahead and start right on with the first slide and talk about HIV and women. And I really think of HIV and women as a perfect storm. And I hope by the time I finish giving you the tidbits and the highlights, you're gonna be able to uh, hopefully agree that it's the intersection of a number of factors that bring us to this point. Next slide. So in this slide, what I want you to really focus on is we're looking at the time period from 2010 to 2017. And if you will notice, please, that these are the diagnoses of HIV infection among female adults and adolescents in the United States and our six dependent territories. And what I really want you to take away from this are a few points. Number one, if you look at the box at the top, that is on a whole different legend because the cases among our American, Indian, Alaska Native, uh, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islander and Asian sisters are not at the same rate as the populations you see in this bigger box. Now let's focus on the bigger box. And what I want you to look at is the purple line and then look at all the others because the purple line is black African-American women. This is how they self-describe compared to Hispanic, Latina, multiple races and white. And if you notice all of the lines began to drop significantly between 2010 and 2013 2013 is when they really began to slow. But I want you to notice that despite this continued very gradual decline, there is the large gap between all the other lines and the line for Black African American. Next slide. In this slide, we're now going to talk about stage three HIV, which is called AIDS. And these are called AIDS classifications. And this is again from the time period of 1985 when we just began to start being able to track this to 2017. And for those who are wondering, well, why doesn't she give me 2018, 2019, 2020? The data do lag behind. So in some cases, I will have data for you for 2017, others 2018, but 2019 and 2020, which of course is a year none of us will forget, uh, the data are lagging. But this is AIDS, this is really advanced disease. And what I want you to notice here is the rise, the quick rise for all women, but particularly for in the large box, black African-American women. And then something that we tend to forget is our Asian and American Indian Alaska native sisters. Look at the brisk rise for the turquoise and the green lines in those. However, if you go on to the year of 2003, 2005, you begin to see the decline. But again, just as in the previous slide, there always is that significant gap between Black African-American women and the other women represented in this graph. Next slide. Why do I do this? Because I want you to see that when we talk about HIV infection in women and female adolescents, and again, this is year end in 2017, what we need to do is remember that this is a geographically uneven distribution. Said differently, it doesn't hit women across the United States the same. So if you look at the Northeast with New York, Connecticut, um, and then New Jersey, come down to mid-Atlantic states, Maryland, and then in the South, from North Carolina down to Florida, across to Mississippi and Louisiana, those are the densest, the deep purple, the densest concentrations of women with being diagnosed with HIV infection. Our second tier states would include the Midwest, and you see here um, Illinois, Missouri, Arkansas, then the Southwest with Texas, and then uh, also in Minnesota, and then looking at the far west, which would be California and Nevada. Next slide. Finally, walking through this categorization, looking at it in a graphic depiction, which makes it perhaps a bit easier to see whether we're talking about Northeast, Midwest, South, or West, Black, African-American women lead far and away compared to any other racial ethnic group. Next slide. How are women becoming infected? And I always think of this as a double-edged sword because unfortunately, sometimes when we talk about how women are being infected, we end up 
allowing individuals to think, well, if I'm not doing that behavior, then therefore I'm perfectly safe. And that's not the case. But if we take a look at the risk behaviors, including heterosexual contact, injection, drug use, or other, when we're looking at Black African-American contrasted to Hispanic, Latina versus white, you can see that heterosexual contact figures prominently in all three uh, racial and ethnic groups, however, particularly in Black and African-American, followed by injection drug use within each group, very small percentages of other. And I want to remind you that other means either it could be through a, a risk that's otherwise not been identified, the individual chose not to respond, or it may have been the rare um, other factors such as a post-surgical intervention. Next slide. So now let's talk about this risk because all too often when women present with HIV infection, one of the biggest things we're saying is, well, how did you get infected and why? But the subtext of that often is, well, if you hadn't done X, we wouldn't be here. And I like Joseph Conrad's uh, quote, which is, being a woman is terribly difficult task since it consists principally in dealing with men. And to our men who are, who are watching, I'm not bashing you, but when we do have a disease with heavy heterosexual transmission, it does mean that women are dealing with men. Next slide. And there are a lot of components of women's HIV risk. And I just wanna take a minute here to unpack this. And we'll talk about this in the context of the list and also in the pictures because they're very intentional. Women's risk for HIV, and as you'll hear uh, with our next speaker, STDs, first and foremost, it's a biological and anatomical risk. It's the way the systems for women's uh, gentle urinary tracts and gentle tracts are constructed. And we'll talk about that. There are behavioral issues because there are still gender and um, social norms, although those are changing, which clearly affect how women behave and how they engage in certain situations. There's no doubt that the educational level of the woman very much affects how much access to an understanding of health information that she has. There are situational contexts. Women who are in situations where there is an unequal power balance or where she is fully dependent for her survival upon another individual limits and may adversely affect how much of a role she can play in protecting herself. Socioeconomic factors, we know that women who are poor, women that have limited or poor access to health care in general, uh, tend to be more at risk and when infected do more poorly. And then finally, there's sociocultural factors. And these are things that are hard to quantify and it requires us to really be proactive in not only identifying them, but engaging with communities to fully hear and engage them as partners so that our work and our research and our policies can be informed and be helpful instead of punitive. So why are these pictures here? Let's go through this. We talked about behavioral risk, we talked about situational risk, and we talked about biological and anatomical. This upper slide here is a picture taken from parties that are were being hosted up into and right up to the time of the pandemic in New York City, where the host organizers would put out an ad for a call for quote, hot women to come and be parties with these men because these were big shots coming to town. Often corporations would engage with them. These young girls would be paid and they were to quote, make the patrons happy and I'll let you fill in the blanks from there. These are women who may be educated, but may have economic or other issues that drive them to engage in this. Let's go to this young girl over here. This is a picture of a young girl. No, she's not from the US, but she's from Mumbai. But I would remind you that the Women's World Health Report recently published revealed that two thirds of the world's illiterate are women. Two thirds of the world's illiterate are women. And they aren't just in other countries, they include in ours. And here she is trying to do her studies because she's homeless on the streets of Mumbai. There are situational, sociocultural and behavioral. So let's switch down here to women's drug of choice. There are not only clearly gender differences in addiction and in women, and there are biological differences in how women respond to these drugs, for example, Women are known to drink alcohol for relaxation and for uh, basically to help soothe them, whereas men more often drink to prove manliness, to um, get up courage, to become aggressive, etc. For example, 
for women who are drug injectors. Many women did not begin their injecting journey on their own. They were injected by partners. So again, even if we, for example, discuss messages of sexual safety, sexual safety may be occurring in the relationship, but there may be needle sharing and that is certainly a risk. And then last, I want to go to this picture over here to remind us of the significant underreported and ongoing role of intimate partner violence. It is difficult, and I would go even further to say it is inappropriate to counsel women to be proactive, to take care of themselves, and to mitigate their risks without knowing if that woman is in a safe situation. Said differently, I have unfortunately cared for women who have been advised, oh, you just must go home and be safe without recognizing that one was already being beaten and to do so placed her at increased risk. That is not to say we don't counsel these women, but we must counsel in context because none of these behaviors and HIV risk in general does not occur in a vacuum. Next slide. Now, before, for those of you who may have hated science, before you tune me out, roll your eyes and say, this is where I bailed out and have to go to the bathroom, I'm gonna make this relatively easy. There's a reason why we are concerned about risk behaviors, particularly anal intercourse, yes, anal sex and vaginal sex, because the two structures look different. If you can, we call these columnar cells, we think of them, just think of them like big pillars that hold up things, but they're only one cell layer thick. And what is in this substance under here is blood vessels, and uh, connective tissue. So as you can see here, when HIV is introduced through semen or blood in the lumen, it's not only that infection can happen because the cells become infected, there's also this process called transcytosis, which I can break down if you just basically means the cells learn how to cross, the virions learn how to cross through and into their target, which is T cells. And in some cases it has been observed in the microscope that HIV can actually bind to uh, a monocyte or macrophage, which will extend its arm between these cells carrying HIV with it like a Trojan. Now, here is the vaginal side of things. And one of the things you'll notice, these are flattened cells, almost if you think of them like fried eggs, but look at how thick the stack is. So during the act of intercourse, particularly if intercourse is associated with some physical abrasions and basically all sexual intercourse at least has micro abrasions, there is the opening of spaces that allows the virion to come through. There are also some cells that actually like dendritic cells or longer Han cells will grab onto the virion and then actually end up delivering it to the T cells. And then finally, as we see over here, macrophages because they are the cleanup crew thinking they're just sweeping clean, will sweep this up and inadvertently deliver it to the body. Next slide. So how do all these intersecting risk domains come together for women? We have, as I've talked about the behavior and social cultural context, there's the biologic fact that women can be more easily infected between semen pooling in the vaginal sac to being able to cross through the cell layers. There are socioeconomic factors, whether the woman is poor or doesn't have control of her situation. And then there are educational factors, remembering that many of the women of the world are uneducated or undereducated, or even if she has the education, may have other conflicts. And it's these intersecting points where we see risk not multiplied, but increased almost logarithmically. And I will end with two simple examples. If you take this section here, you see there's the overlap of education or lack thereof with the biology being young, with the behavioral context and with the socioeconomic. And this would really explain, for example, be one of the ways that the risks intersect for the young woman I saw who had limited resources. She knew she was dependent upon her partner. She knew her partner's abuse if she had presented to emergency care several times after beatings, but was unable to leave and knew that this man was engaging with sexual contact with others. Or down here, where there's the biological factor, there's a socioeconomic factor, and there's also the educational factor. And this was a woman that actually did not have uh, HIV, but she came to me because she wanted to be cleared for a hip replacement. And in speaking to her about her uh, risk behaviors, which I make a practice to do with everyone, she informed me that she was more concerned that the hip would, operation would interfere with her ability to move her legs. And I 
thought she was a distance walker at the ripe old age of 85 and congratulated her on that and said, no, you'll certainly be able to walk. And she said, no, doctor, I mean, getting my legs up in the air, which certainly intrigued me. Uh, and she said that she charged the men with whom she had sex money, not because she wasn't uneducated, not because she didn't uh, have any other resources, but because she was on a fixed income. And she felt that her deceased husband had done his best to provide for her and she wasn't going to squander that, that if someone wanted to have sex with her, they could pay her for it. Next slide. So we need to take into account the many contexts to go forward. And I would remind us that every minute, somewhere in the world, a young woman is newly infected with HIV. And I would juxtapose that with a message from our federal partners, which is that we can stop HIV together and we can, but it will take all of us. Thank you. Carmi, I think you're on mute. <laughs> Look, I, I was just, I'm here writing notes and I'm, I'm trying to talk at the same time. What a powerful presentation. And that, that last example you gave of somebody making sure that if my legs are going to be up, somebody else is paying for it. It's, it's not coming out of my retirement fund. Wow. That, that is an incredible example of how you then talk to people in the context of where they are and what they say their needs are. Uh, look, I know that there are a lot of folks who are clamoring to jump into the mix because you just put a lot of things out there. But first, anyone who has ever attended a Why Women Cry conference before knows that when we turn the lights on the center stage, we always have several stars that show up. So our next featured conversational choreographer is Barbara Wilgus, a certified registered nurse practitioner providing outpatient care at the John G. Bartlett Specialty Practice at Johns Hopkins. Barbara is what we would call an STI traffic monitor, meaning she can tell you how fast to go, where to watch the curves, and when you should come to a complete stop. <laughs> Barbara, it is always a pleasure to have you in the room. And right now we want you to step on this virtual dance floor and teach us some new steps. The spotlight is all yours. Thank you so much. And I want to thank especially the organizers of the conference. I want to thank Sisters Together in Reaching and uh, my, my heart and my soul, Dr. Hickman, um, Reverend Hickman, because because as you know, I would do anything for you and here I am doing it. So I'm going to talk, I'm going to supplement Dr. Cargill's um, wonderful, wonderful presentation. Um, and you can go ahead and put my slides up um, with a little bit of um, a, a wider support, um, thinking about um, what else is involved in ending the HIV epidemic. And what I really want to talk about is really sexual health in general. Um, so in other words, there's not a way to end HIV if we're not ending all the other STIs as well, or at least um, seeing someone through a whole lens of sexual health. So um, I have a few data slides and I have a lot of really strong opinions. So let's look at a little bit of data. First, this is chlamydia. Um, so this is in the U.S., um, so you'll see over the past, um, since 2010, so the past like decade or so, um, rates of chlamydia remain high, um, especially among younger women, um, but they've stayed fairly steady with a little bit of an increase, but they do remain fairly high and are primarily diagnosed um, in the younger ages. And I don't know if you can see my camera, but I'm doing air quotes. So um, 15 to 29, um, this kind of is mainly looking at 15 to 44 as reproductive health age women, which is what the CDC STD surveillance, when they tease out um, rates in women, that's primarily what they look at. Next slide. Um, and you'll see gonorrhea as well um, with actually a little bit more of a sharper increase, but still fairly steadily high rates um, in especially the younger women, 15 to 29, but um, steady rates with an increase as well. Now I want you to think about what Dr. Cargill noted where HIV was falling 
And then around 2017, it's just kind of leveled off and hasn't fallen any further. And if you look at these dates, you kind of see that right around that same time frame are where STIs start really a sharp increase. Um, next slide. And that's most noticeable with primary and secondary syphilis. Um, so when I came to um, Baltimore in 97 to start uh, seeing patients at the um, sexual health clinics at Baltimore City Health Department, where I still am to this day, um, really um, syphilis rates, we were really focused on eliminating syphilis. And it looked like a real possibility um, for everyone um, in you know, the early 2000s. And then it started rising again, um, largely uh, in men, because there was sort of a, an epidemic among men who have sex with men. But you'll see here in the past decade for sure, and in the past five years of this decade for definitely, um, rates among women have sharply, sharply increased, um, and especially in women of reproductive age. Um, and another thing that kind of goes along with uh, primary and secondary syphilis being the, being the time that is the most infectious. Um, next slide. What goes along with that, unfortunately, is that as primary and secondary syphilis is um, increasing among women of reproductive age, congenital syphilis, which is the infection of a neonate um, during pregnancy, um, is also sharply increasing. So this is a lot of morbidity. This is a lot of of stillbirths. So this is a lot of really serious health outcomes. Um, and primarily to me, this is also a marker and this is my strong opinion, but this is a marker of the need for comprehensive sexual health services and reproductive health services for women and the lack of that where they are accessing healthcare. Um, one more slide about congenital syphilis, next slide that really shows that um, is, so this is looking back, this was a new slide that CDC put out this year and it made me cry actually when I first saw it. So now you know what makes me cry. Um, so it used to be like, you know, so years back, people might say that, okay, well, pregnant women, they're just not coming to prenatal care. And that's why their baby is being born with syphilis. And maybe that was the majority of cases you know, five years ago, six years ago, seven years ago, but you'll see here as, as it's changed that really women get timely syphilis diagnosis in prenatal care and are still not getting adequate treatment of syphilis and therefore have a congenital syphilis baby. Um, and that's just tragic to me and it's horrifying. So um, to me, this is a marker, this is on us as providers and as the community that serves women. Um, if you're not providing medical comprehensive sexual health care, this is what the end result can be. Um, next slide. I'm gonna show you all a little bit about Maryland as well. Um, so these are slides directly from the Maryland Department of Health. Um, so just showing kind of where we are as compared to the US. So the, the most of everything, we're above US rates um, and here's our ranking. We've kind of stayed a little bit the same, gone up a little bit for gonorrhea and chlamydia, but you'll see our rates overall have increased. The only place where our, our rates in Maryland are lower than US rates is in congenital syphilis. And that's largely because not that our rates have gone down because they've gone up by 7%, but congenital syphilis rates have skyrocketed in other parts of the country as well. And that's really the only reason. It's not because of anything better we've done so far. Um, next slide. Um, I'm just, I'm harping a little bit on congenital syphilis again, because this is a, another, again, it's a marker of women's sexual health to me. Um, so this is actually um, rates from 2010 to 2019, the state of Maryland. Um, and then in 2019, the highest number of cases since 2009, um, representing a 46.3% rate increase. So that's lots and lots and lots of cases. Um, next slide. And I don't, people harp on Baltimore a lot. and 
I'm from Baltimore and don't harp on my city state because look, women's sexual health is lacking all over this state. It is not only a Baltimore city issue. So this is the risk for congenital syphilis um, all across the state. And you see there's no zero risk and there's a whole lot of red counties all over the place. Um, so it's not just Baltimore city, it's everywhere in the state and providers everywhere should be thinking about sexual health. Um, next slide. Um, and additionally, so some barriers to care that have been teased out um, with people delivering an a infant diagnosed with congenital syphilis. So this is the past three years. There is a lot of it. There is a huge increase in um, people who reported having sex under the influence of substances or IV drug use, non IV drug use and sex work. Um, now, what I want to say to this is that, again, this is on us as providers and as a community, because if you're a sex worker, if you're using substances, you have an absolute right and you deserve good, comprehensive sexual health care. Hear me say this again. You, as a woman who are a sex worker and a substance user, if you're a single woman, if you're a married woman, if you're anybody at all, you deserve comprehensive, sex positive, sexual health care that can get you to your healthiest state. So you can prevent HIV, so you can prevent all these other STIs. So come see me at the sexual health clinics in Baltimore City Health Department. I work there on Wednesdays and Thursdays. Um, so um, I do wanna say a little bit about kind of COVID and how that impacted Maryland. Um, this is just a little bit of a snapshot. Um, next slide. So, um, how these rates all got impacted by COVID, as everyone remembers, everything shut down. Um, we all stayed home, but um, we didn't all stop having sex. Um, so what happened, this is kind of a timeline here, um, and this compares 2019, which is just kind of your normal, you know, this is just how many tests were done at the Maryland State Laboratory. So this isn't all labs, this isn't, this is just, like specimens that got sent to the state laboratory. But you'll see in 2020, when everything shut down, the number of tests sharply decreased. And while they're kind of, you know, coming back up as things reopen, um, still less tests are being done than were done in 2019. But then if you compare that to, and again, this is still the Maryland State Laboratory data. Um, so next slide. Um, if you go to actually the number of cases, you see that sharp decline and that's, you can see right there that that is just a matter of nobody was getting tested, nothing is getting reported because they're just, you know, they're, if there are no tests, there are no reports. Um, but as things have started to reopen and people are able to access healthcare again, um, that see that little black line of 2020 through December came right back up to where it was um in 2019 and 2018 um so that means in reality it's probably a higher number because there's still lots of people that still have not accessed um medical care yet so um i just want us as providers and community and women to actually you know think about the fact that this is our right sexual health is our right. Getting tested for gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, trichomonas, HIV, um, the whole package of sexual health services. Um, it's, it's our right. Um, and final slide of data is just that it is actually the law as far as syphilis goes. Um, during pregnancy in Maryland, all people are screened for syphilis at the first prenatal visit rescreened at 28 weeks gestation and screening at delivery if a person lives in an area with high syphilis prevalence, which you just saw that map of Maryland. Um, so at delivery, if a person is considered at high risk, which can include the morbidity of your surrounding areas. Um, I mentioned this also because this is the law in Maryland for syphilis. I asked the other day uh, when I was watching um, 
um, a lecture um, on HIV transmission maternal to child. Um, and in Maryland, HIV testing at delivery is not written into law. It can be offered and many times is offered, which is wonderful, but it's only um, required at the beginning of prenatal care. So it's something also to consider um, that when you're thinking about sexual health services in general, that while we remember HIV testing, we also remember all the other testing, but also while we do all the other testing, we're not forgetting HIV testing. And most importantly, um, HIV prevention. I talked to everyone about, have you heard about HIV prevention with PrEP? And I am hopeful that lots more and more people, as people find out about PrEP, decide for themselves if they want to use it. Um, it's a very effective tool to prevent HIV and um, come see me for sexual health services. Um, so this is the end of my slides. It's never the end of my opinions. So I look forward to a robust discussion after this. <laughs> Well, Barbara, thank you so much. I mean, you you were you were right that you just laid right into what uh, Dr. Cargill started us off with, and and bringing that you two certainly have laid open the uh, conversation around the importance of women being viewed and heard within their patient and patient service settings. Uh, by by their providers and other caretakers. So uh, I'm I'm looking at the time. I mean, we are we are running. This has been great already, but we we have time for maybe a couple of questions. So if you all would maybe even uh, talk a little bit more around what you see as some of the need for standard screenings, the you know standard screenings that should happen. You said there are just some things that should happen when women show up to their providers or to the health departments. Um, Barbara, you very specifically, you, you put it in this term, you said you have a right to a certain level of care. So what should people walk in? Let's give them some dance moves to make when they go into those arenas. Uh, uh, Barbara if, and, and Vicki, if you'll jump right on in. Sure, well, Barbara said something I wanted to just pick up on because I think that we often have some preconceived notions about how people operate, which drive our policy, which is unfortunate. We think that science drives our policy, but we know that's bogus. It's actually what we think. And I'll give you an example, which Barbara just brought up, which is you'll test someone at the beginning of pregnancy, but when they come to labor and delivery, you don't test them again for HIV. Now, why is that bogus? First of all, it's probably predicated on the assumption that just because a woman is large, she's not going to have sex, which we know is foolish. Second, there's a very good reason to test, and that is because we know from the data, there are a significant portion of women who present as HIV negative at the outset of pregnancy, mm -hmm. but become HIV positive during pregnancy. And there's some very good women-specific physiology reasons for that, including what happens to the cervix, what happens to the blood supply, so that if there is sexual contact and there is a discharge of HIV variants, they're more likely to find a target. And then to me, the most frightening is there's a compelling reason to test women at the last trimester. And that is because women in the third trimester of pregnancy are the closest you're gonna look like to someone with HIV infection and not being infected. Meaning women with pregnancy in the third trimester experience a flip in their T cells. And that's mm -hmm. God giving us the chance to not eat up our own fetus. So if you take a look at the diseases that become the most disabling and actually kill women in the third trimester. If you look at flu, the bulk of the women who are in an intensive care unit on a ventilator with flu are in the third trimester of pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Malaria, the people who get malaria of the brain, which is rare, overwhelmingly women in the third trimester of pregnancy. I mean, there's been papers written about this. And yet, there's this sort of, I don't want to attribute it to male, but this Pollyanna, oh, she's pregnant, so she's not having sex. What? No. And then everyone is surprised when you have a child that you clamp the cord and you take a look and the pediatrician said something's wrong, you decide to do the foot spot, and then it's like, oh my God, this child's got a viral load. Well, who didn't test her? Mm -hmm. Why didn't you test her? Oh. And that's why I say sometimes we do our policies and decision-making on things that have absolutely zero to do with physiology and everything to do with our bias. Mm -hmm. wow. Yep. 
And uh, Dr. Cargill mentioned in our kind of private chat as speakers over here, and I do want to actually say this publicly, like congenital syphilis can be stigmatizing to the woman and to the child. And it, and, and it's really, it's our failure. Like congenital syphilis is our failure. Um, and, and, and it's, something that I do want people to just always think of that like, you know, the person sitting across from you is, is a human being. Like I saw a patient earlier this year who, or last year, I don't know what is time anymore, um, but who had a stillbirth from congenital syphilis and was coming in to finish treatment. And the first thing I said was, I'm so sorry for your loss not one person in three different healthcare settings had said that one thing to this person mm -hmm. who lost a baby mm -hmm. and just you know it it to me again it's it's just it's a failure of the system and it's not a failure necessarily of the person um because i think if we're if we can if we can provide services to people where they need them so if we can help substance use clinics get HIV and STI screening and reproductive health services at their at their substance use clinic. You know, if, if you're coming there for some other service, um, you know, be able to access everything. And then on that kind of flip side, if you're going to your primary care provider for just whatever your primary care reason is, they should be asking you about your sex life even if you're old like me, like they should be asking you because you don't know what I do. Like, you know, and, and, and they should be offering comprehensive sexual health services. If you're 15, 13, 12, 75. Yeah. 95. Exactly. But as you know, there have been a number of studies of primary care providers that shows that this is where we have to go back to how we train people because primary care providers are often very uncomfortable asking people about their sexual health and sexual behavior. Even the CDC went back and took a look at the long-term outcome of their sexual health training sessions and found that a full third of the providers they trained within a year and a half to two years stopped doing it. Because, and the biggest reason they offered was they were concerned about how the patients would perceive it. And I have to remind us that sometimes the reason our patients respond to our questions in a certain way is because the way we ask. I mean, mm -hmm. if you ask someone about sex with your head down and you're digging your foot in the floor and you're kind of picking at your clothes, it is so uncomfortable that they will do almost anything to end that. It's like, okay, let me get my provider out of their discomfort zone here. And so I think we have to be able to do that. And again, this is where we have an example of how policy took time to catch up with our perceptions versus science, because we know that people over 50 are having sex, take a look at the rising rates in STIs and HIV in that population. But yet, you know, we kind of make this assumption that, well, they're over 75 and so having sex, so we don't talk about it. You know, my grandmother had a wonderful expression for that. She said, just because there's snow on the roof, don't assume the furnace is broken. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's exactly what we do though. Oh, you're old, so you can't be having sex. Um, and you know, what? you you guys, you guys, you are both so phenomenal. I told you. <laughs> see, I told you all that they would teach you some new dance moves <laughs> here today because these ladies, they could keep coming down the pathway. And there is so much, so much more. We thank you for coming and sharing with us your passion. We can hear it in your voices. We can hear it in your presentations. And we know that Baltimore and other places throughout Maryland are going to be well taken care of because you said some things. Barbara, you said, let the providers take responsibility for what's not happening. And, and Dr. Vicki, you said, look, counsel in context. Thank you so much for being our star dancers in this <laughs> virtual dance room on today. Right now, Dr. Tatiana Warren is coming with a greeting and some other words. Thank you all. Bye.
Reverend Carmi, thank you so much. I'm so glad to um, join the dance virtual stage for STAR. That was an amazing session five. Thank you so much, Dr. Vicki. Thank you, Barbara, for such amazing words. Um, and continuing the party, we have an amazing actor and singer. You guys may know him as the Velvet Teddy Bear, Ruben Stuttered. He is, uh, he was the second season American Idol winner. And he has a special message for Reverend Hickman, followed by his wonderful song, What If? And I say, what if we end this epidemic? Hello, everybody. I'm Ruben Stutter, and I'm pleased to offer congratulations to the CEO and founder of Sisters Together and Reaching Incorporated, Reverend Deborah Hickman, on 30 years of service and the 16th year of Why Women Cry Conference. Congratulations, Reverend Deborah Hickman, and God bless you. I'm having some problems at my house. I need you to get over here right now. All right, then. Mm -hmm.
Why Women Cry Conference 2021 has been amazing. Session number five, continuing dancing in the face of fear, HIV and STIs ending the epidemic. Thank you, Reverend Carmi, for an amazing moderated session with Dr. Vicki Carhill and Barbara Wilgis. We continue this party, hold tight. We have a special announcement and special door prizes from Kayla and Tracy. Thank you, um, Dr. Tati, um, for announcing us. Um, that was a great introduction. Thank you so much to all of our sponsors that um, have been throughout the sessions and we are in session five and I'm so grateful that we're in session five <laughs> and we're having a good time. There's a lot of information that's out there. A special thank you to Carmi, um, Barbara and Vicki and also Peter. Thank you so much. Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, yes, next, this, this week's uh, session is mind blowing. You know, I've learned so much, you know, attending these sessions and actually being a part of the Wild Women Cry Coalition. I, although my grandmother does work with, um, you know, HIV and ending up epidemic, I do not know a lot of things. My doctor do not tell me a lot of things that I should know that I've just like, you know, learned. I just learned that, you know, the rates of the clap, as my generation may say, is like it starts from 15 to 29 and is like increasing as we talk right now. Like, and I think we need to change those numbers. It should be from 12 to 99 because like Barbara said, you don't know what I'm doing. You don't know what my <laughs> business <laughs> is. And I have, you know, teenagers that aren't going to express to their doctors that they have been sexually active. They don't know. Right. They, they, they hide and they talk, they keeping their secrets. They not going to tell you, they not comfortable with you. So we need to have these conversations of getting uncomfortable and being vulnerable to our doctors and letting them know about our health issues. So let's work on purpose to end in this epidemic. Yes. So next week we have sex appeal, <laughs> relationships and intimate partner violence and sex and sexuality. We will have moderator Linda Shrugs and panelists Ann Wiseman, Wahida, don't, don't kill me, Wahida Shabazz Eo as a panelist. And for oh. entertainment, we have Paula, Paula Campbell. Great oh, session you. six, yes. <laughs> you know, you know the mix, you know the club mix, you know the mix. <laughs> My grandmother would be up and dancing to the Newton. <laughs> so yes, we have all oh raffle time. We have our raffle time. You ready? Yes. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Oh yes. And our winner is Miss Vita Moore. Vita Moore. Please send your email, send an email to dhickman at sisters together and reaching.org, and we will have your prize next Wednesday. Come in next Wednesday to claim your prize. You get a bag, you get a t shirt, and you get a gift card. <laughs> so, so we're looking forward to Vita Moore reaching out to us. Yes, and we have a special uh, treat for you guys. Give us one second. I guess. Y'all ready? Y'all ready? Y'all ready? Y'all ready? Here we go, Wild Women Cry! Yeah! We in here! Let's go! Woo! Wild Women Cry, here we go! 15, 16, woo! <laughs> And that's it. Good job, guys. Ooh, I told you.